I find myself going further and further back uh, uh, in, in terms of, of, of learning and, 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 uh, and drawing uh, from historical references <clears throat> for, to expand the musical vocabulary. Um, that is to say that uh, uh, I've come to uh, more recently a deeper appreciation and uh, 
have a newfound thirst for knowledge about the elder statesmen uh, in the music and what they were doing, and even beyond. Uh, uh, that beyond being, uh, uh, I have a, a considerable interest now in what has commonly, is commonly called these days third world music. Um, actually, that's in reality the music of the African uh, diaspora. Uh, uh, from a historical sense, and um, as a matter of fact, I had uh, I had planned to enroll at University of Michigan this uh, this fall, uh, missed registration for uh, cultural anthropology. Uh, that's where my interests are going, generally and specifically as refer as relates to the music. Um, on this year's Montro, we introduced a new piece that really wasn't completely orchestrated, and some would say not ready to play, but, uh, uh, and it was entitled Hymn to Obatala, uh, Obatala being the great Yoruba god of creativity and the cultural protector. And um, um, that piece was pretty much reflective of where my head is at regarding uh, musical direction now, uh, trying to go back to go forward, so to speak. In the throes of examining different kinds of uh, instrumentation, you know, um, taking a crash course, as it were, from, uh, from uh, Tani Tabal and, and picking the minds of some of our uh, locally based master drummists, <laughs> and, and uh, percussionists uh, to learn the actual meanings of various different rhythms and uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, incorporate them not in an eclectic sense but uh, 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 in a very deliberate sense in the uh, you know future uh, compositions. Um, I'm more compositionally oriented uh, than I am performance oriented, so to speak. Uh, piano, I've always uh, enjoyed playing the piano. The piano has been my major instrument for some time. But um, my bent has, has been not so much as a, a piano as piano or uh, uh, to be a piano soloist extraordinaire uh, as it has been to be an accompanist, uh, to be an orchestrator uh, with that instrument. And, um, and uh, so, you know, my, uh, my concentration usually is on, on writings and, and, um, and the various different elements of that, and then, of course, employing the, the piano along the way. Uh, as opposed to, you know, concentrating on the pedagogy and the pyrotechnics of, of what they call uh, contemporary uh, keyboards. Um, that kind of belies the fact, I, I guess, in, a, in one sense, you know, that, uh, that uh, I'm supposed part of a, a great dynasty of Detroit pianists. Um, who uh, certainly all of them have been real firebrands and uh, have uh, left uh, great historical marks in terms of their uh, facility <coughs> at the piano. Uh, but uh, I don't know for, you know, ever since I was a youngster, I think, I've been more inclined uh, toward the, 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 the overall composition of the music, you know. Uh, for instance, that I, I'm sure that when I was a kid and we'd go to the show, I was probably the, the only one under 21 years of age, you know, in the theater uh, who was paying particular attention to the movie scores. And uh, I mean, it just wasn't done. I mean, you know, this, the scores were there and they were, they were taken for granted. 
but I knew who Alex Norris was and and uh, Dimitri Tiomkin and and um, and uh, Max Steiner and uh, all of the of the uh, the studio composers of uh, of the f 40s and the in the 50s uh, because uh, the orchestrations were were particularly appealing to me and I think there was it was that kind of consciousness um, that uh, sort of took precedent over actual you know performance uh, technique as a as a direction well the degree, degree of jam band first of all personnel wise is is, is a repertory uh, ensemble or, or over the years I guess basically 10 years of his existence uh, uh, the faces have changed considerably some of some some of the folks have been holdovers right from the beginning and but still other uh, still numbers of others have, have have changed practically with every performance um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think of the degree as personnel as being all all of the all of the uh, the available and wonderful talents you know that reside in this area um, and uh, the repertoire has has been by and large principally uh, original compositions that I've penned although we've you know we've done and do welcome uh, those of others uh, we've we've played some of Phil Leslie's work we've played some of Vincent Bowen's work and, uh, we've played some of Francisco Mora's work so it's not a, exclusively a, a, a venue for for uh, airing my own compositions, but in the main, it has been, and um, <clears throat> and uh, the 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 repertoire generally uh, is to uh, is to represent uh, hopefully the variety of different styles or what I've come to prefer to call dialects that there are uh, in this music. Uh, you may hear, you haven't heard any of that guard, as it were, yet, but that's only because the band has not been as well rehearsed as we would like. And uh, in order to play music on the cutting edge like that, uh, uh, I, I feel as though there's a, there's a certain degree of, of, uh, of, uh, affinity that has to be developed amongst the members because that's it's really cosmic and uh, you know when you get to stratifying rhythms and there's a there's a whole lot of ESP going on on the bandstand uh, especially when you're playing attempting to play music of that uh, form non-form <laughs> and uh, and so uh, this ensemble is so large uh, meaning you got just that many more personalities that have to interlock, um, and uh, and as I said, so under rehearsed, so to speak, that uh, you know we haven't attempted any of that type of literature, but that may happen yet, you know. Uh, but save for that, we try to um, we try to represent in a in a repertoire various di the various different styles, the various different dialects uh, of this music that is loosely called. And I have now got to the point where I pretty much uh, hold the title of jazz in disdain because um, uh, it's certainly today, uh, unfortunately. Uh, there is not uh, a clear picture of what that music is supposed to re represent, uh, you know, to the general public. And um, I don't know what a better term for it would be, but uh, uh, I, I, I do kind of take acceptance, to, you know, to everybody being thrown in the same, same pot because uh, obviously the same amount of discipline and knowledge is, is not uh, uh, common, you know, throughout the, uh, the jazz personalities and the, the jazz styles. Um, so it, uh, uh, that is pretty much what, what the Gorilla Jam Band is all about. Um, Gorillas, which is the proper name, 
Uh, guerrillas are rebels. They're uh, generally thought of as uh, revolutionaries, uh, uh, anti-establishment uh, bush fighters, as it were. And uh, that uh, was the genesis of the name, because I, I have felt for, for many years that um, we are people at risk, and I'm talking specifically about the African American now. Uh, I'm not concerned about the rest of it. I'm concerned specifically about an African American, and uh, um, and uh, unfortunately, I feel that we're and have felt for some time that we're people at risk. But that premise gave birth to the idea of calling the band the Guerrilla Jam Band. Um, sort of a platoon of protectorates of the, the culture uh, from, a, from a musical standpoint. Um, hopefully nothing that we would attempt to play would be meaningless. You know, just another blues or just another, <laughs> just another rhythm. But uh, would be entitled uh, and hopefully perform in such a way as to create certain certain images that remind, you know, or advance a thought relative specifically to to our culture. Now, if, uh, if in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way of entertainment, you know, if, uh, if it's if it's entertaining, if it's uh, if it's uh, meaningful, you know, to to someone beyond that, that's fine. The tuba has been a mainstay of the band for some 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 time now, at least three years, maybe a little longer. Um, and uh, my son has been playing oboe with us. Uh, that's that's not uh, necessarily uh, uh, standard uh, instrumentation uh, in itself. But beyond that, uh, I'd like to uh, 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 place the percussion uh, ultimately in the, in the upfront position in, in the orchestra as it, uh, um, in, in keeping with some of the older traditions of the, of the music. Um, uh, sitting behind you there is a chorus, maybe we can a little bit later go on flash on it or something. But uh, we have a, a resident, uh, we're fortunate to have a, a, a Singalese Cora artist uh, resident uh, in, the, in the metropolitan area now. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to get him to do some things with the, with the Gurias. And uh, just employ, uh, start employing, uh, you know, some, some instrumentation, you know, that is, uh, um, uh, more authentic relative to the the, um, the compositions and, uh, and, it, and, it, and the, pr the proper timbre, you know, for for the compositions that are are, are being conjured up. I just, I, you know, I I just uh, I kind of shudder at. Um, the all too common uh, lack of uh, aesthetic consciousness, you know, amongst an, a number of, of, of players today, you know, and that's not just the young players either, unfortunately, you know, so some of my peers are kind of deadheads when it comes to their, uh, their aesthetic, their, their musical vision, you know, this is not like a, this is not a profession as it were, you know, where you know, you weren't learn one formula, you learn one one particular pedagogy, and then that's that's it. Uh, uh, you should be constantly growing. Um, even our elder statesmen. Every time I listen to them, you know that their their style is very distinctive. You know, I mean, it's 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 almost emblazoned in stone. Yet every time I hear them, I hear something. New. I hear them reaching for something. I have never heard um, the Charles Victor Moore or, or or Percy Gabriel. You know when they didn't do something a little bit different. You know, 
uh, which is I think that's 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 really the soul of you know a real artist, um, and that's that's the, the the real mark of an artist. You know, certainly John Coltrane was, uh, you know, when he when he passed away, you know, he was still. Uh, reaching for, and, and you could, obviously you could hear it in his playing, you know, he was reaching for other things. Phil Asley and I were just talking about it yesterday, again for about the 99,000th time, <laughs> and uh, because we, we were blessed. I, that had to be one of the most, if not the most fertile period uh, uh, in the Detroit area. Uh, for growing up in, for, uh, for, for the music. And uh, to be growing up in the midst of that at the time was just, uh, I, I have related the story in, in part and in, in total many, many times. And it, and it, it seems unbelievable to, to uh, many people, particularly those younger than I, or who might have come up in a, in a, in a different uh, city. But, um, um, there was music everywhere. There was music to be found everywhere. Every neighborhood had at least one bar, okay, for starters. Had one bar that had live music in it. It may have been a blues band, it may have been a rhythm and blues band, whatever. It, it may have been a, kind of a, a, a hawk hackneyed, uh, uh, what you might say, a cabaret style jazz band or whatever. But it was, there was music everywhere. And um, um, the, uh, as a youngster, um, uh, fortunately, I could go into most of those bars. This was all over town. This was all over town. I mean, the west side, north side, you, were, you just weren't hurting for music anywhere. And um, uh, further, as, uh, as a youngster, fortunately, uh, at the time, uh, all of my, my peers were, were into good music, you know, uh, whether it be rhythm and blues or, or pop like, like, like Johnny Mathis and, and uh, stuff like that. It was a uh, Nat Cole. It was all good music. And so, so subsequently that manifested itself in their, their musical choices when it came to them with their various different social uh, clubs and fraternities and, and whatnot. When they gave affairs, they'd always have live music and they'd always have um, the, you know, the younger jazz musicians, as it were, uh, play for these dances. So there was uh, a considerable amount of music to listen to and there was a considerable amount of opportunity to play. Uh, further, uh, we had master artists in residence who were uh, gre the, the greatest of mentors in that they threw, they, they threw their homes open and it was like a daily thing, not the least of which was Barry Harris. Um, I don't know how his wife ever took it because uh, I, can't, I can't recall them ever having a private moment uh, because it was always Charles McPherson and Lonnie Hillier and, and, and there's tons of people, uh, mostly young dudes, streaming in and out of his house. And uh, likewise, um, Joe Brazil uh, uh, had a home out in Coney Gardens. And uh, every weekend, for sure, there were session parties out at out at Joe Brazil's house. And uh, Joe Brazil's house, in case it's not on record anyplace else, Joe Brazil's house was, was uh, where John Coltrane would stay uh, when he was in town. And uh, that's where he met his wife, uh, Alice McLeod Coltrane. And um, the camaraderie that, uh, that existed uh, between all ages and all um, music musicians of all disciplines, you know, was 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 quite incredible, 
and uh, and so all of that in conjunction, that environment. Oh no, I gotta I gotta mention I gotta mention the social environment because that uh, that was something else that was very, uh, by contrast, a new, uh, very much different from what we experience today. Um, the the average the average listener then you know would uh, they would come out in couples or you know it might be a, a, a group of ladies that would come out uh, stag as it were you know or it might might be just the guys hanging out uh, it was always it was a mix of that but the, and uh, they would come out and they would genuinely come out not just for the music but for the the, the social experience. And, uh, and, you know, a casual look in on the, on the average bar, one, one would, I guess, wonder, you know, were they actually there for the music? Uh, because it, they, they had such a good time. It was, it was quite warm. It was like uh, everybody commented about how warm this year's Macho Festival felt. Well, it was like that in every bar, you know, all the time. And uh, yet, uh, all of these folks, to a man, to a woman, were very discerning listeners. They could tell you, you know, when you blew on, uh, you know, a couple of notes in the in the third bar or the second chorus of a blues. That's what existed then, and that certainly was also uh, uh, a great um, uh, uh, help. Uh, in 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 developing, uh, you know, as a, as a young musician, because that was as much as to say, not only you, did you have a place to hear all of these wonderful musicians like the West End Hotel, you know, the scene of my not so misspent youth, <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, and the and the Bluebird Inn and uh, and uh, Klein's and. Uh, Occasionally, the Rouge Lounge and, and uh, the, the Madison and Greystone ballrooms, of course. Uh, you have all of this going, uh, these places to hear people, and, uh, and you, uh, you, you also had these neighborhood bars, cabaret parties, and the little fraternity uh, dances and whatnot. Uh, where you could learn to play, so to speak, and uh, and the jam sessions and so forth. So not only did you have all of that, but you also had uh, a social climate, which was generally encouraging, you know, of the young musician. Oddly enough, I don't know if I should even put it that way. No, I will put it that way, and then I'll explain the answer. Uh, oddly enough, my 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 first major influence was Horace Silver. I liked Horace because of uh, Horace's sense of uh, accompaniment, his sense of orchestration, you know, uh, uh, having been a uh, uh, formally trained pianist, I, I recognized the difference between uh, his facility and say that of a Bud Powell and, and so forth. But uh, yet, uh, initially, Horace Silver was my absolute favorite pianist. And, um, uh, but very quickly, of course, um, uh, Barry Harris and Tommy Flanagan uh, uh, became, uh, became my favorite living, accessible pianist. Uh, I naturally stood in awe of, of, of uh, Bud Powell. Um, Art Tatum, I just said, well, hey. <laughs> See, because uh, right, uh, right up until the time I was um, about 14, 13 or so, you know, I, I, I had wanted to play trumpet. I was playing trumpet, uh, you know, uh, and it was a good uh, uh, concert trumpet player, yeah. um, but um, after I heard Dizzy Gillespie, 
Uh, more specifically, after I heard Clifford Brown, I just, you know, as well, you know, I'll never be able to do that, you know, so I decided to concentrate on the piano after that. Um, but I, uh, you know, uh, I've always, I've always liked the horns, and maybe that again speaks to my uh, predilection for, for accompaniment, as, as opposed to solo work. And um, <clears throat> uh, but the the earliest, the earliest, the earliest idol was Horace, and then I liked Hampton Horse quite a bit. You know, but. Uh, uh, I, I, I liked a lot of different pianists for, for different things. Uh, I liked Hervey. Uh, Hervey, uh, Hervey added to the piano uh, an entirely different language, uh, harmonically. Um, and uh, not that this wasn't already being done, it was being already being done by Bill Evans. But uh, Bill Evans' sense of swing certainly wasn't uh, what Herbie's was. And therein was the difference, because it, it still remains true. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Everything's got a pocket to it. Since this is a, um, a historical document, I might as well go on the record uh, about my favorite pianist. Uh, I spent a lot of time with Barry Harris. Oddly enough, I didn't spend that time until I moved to New York in 60. But, uh, and I learned an, an incredible amount, and I'm still learning from Barry. Um, but be that as it may, I'd have to say, if you wanted to pin me down to who's my all-time favorite pianist, I'd have to say it's Tommy Flanagan. Uh, I have really stood in awe of Tommy for I can't tell you how long. Um, that there's, there's something especially elegant about the way he approaches the piano, and um, that that appeals to me. And uh, I've always said when I grew up. I want to sound just like him. <laughs> and I still say, when I grow up, <laughs> I want to sound just like him. I uh, was uh, called by Charles Bowles um, to uh, make an audition with Etta Jones. And uh, she was working on the road at the time. Of course, she lived in New York. And uh, she needed a new pianist uh, to, to go on the road with her. So I made that audition and uh, was hired. So it was at that point, uh, you know, I'm a young guy, just barely 20 years of age, so I left. And, I, uh, and I subsequently, uh, I didn't go to New York immediately. Uh, we left here and we went on a tour and it took me out to, I think, in fact, I think I went to California first. Well, we went all down, we went to Cleveland and then down south and then we went out to, to, uh, to California, which was always like a three or four month stay whenever we got out there. And, um, but then ultimately, you know, when we finished, finished that tour, you know, I uh, settled in New York. And it was, it was a heck of a time. It was a, a, a great time to be in New York. I've had the best of all worlds, I think, in terms of this, this music. Um, because Birdland was still happening. The Five Spot was still happening. Um, um, the Half Note. Uh, there were, there were a zillion clubs, and then there were still clubs up, uptown, like uh, the, the, the Shalimar and the Prelude and, and uh, Count Basie's, which uh, uh, I think they're still paying the kind of money they were paying back then. <laughs> but uh, but there, was, uh, there was quite a bit happening in New York, and then there was uh, um, uh, just, just a collection of uh, 
of young Turks, you know. Uh, Herbie uh, had just arrived uh, not too many months before I got there. Uh, he came through with a band uh, that uh, Donald Byrd was heading up. And um, let me see. Uh, McCoy had left. He had left the jazz tab I think, to to uh, to start working with the, this this tenor player who was still considered rather strange in his approach, named John Coltrane. <laughs> so it was um, it was it was just a great time to uh, to be in New York. It couldn't have been a, a better time for for me to go certainly. Um, uh, but as far as uh, the reason for uh, everybody seemingly leaving uh, at that time, there were great numbers of people that left, but everybody didn't leave. Teddy Harris stayed here. Uh, Harold McKinney stayed here. Uh, Marcus was on the road, uh, but he ultimately based himself here. Um, so there, there were still, still a lot of guys here, but... Um, um, it's generally thought, you know, that it was, you know, a great exodus and the preponderance of musicians, uh, young musicians did go to New York at the time. And I think that basically was the reason for it. Not because things had gotten so bad here, uh, although there was, a, you know, there was a certain decline, but, uh, um, uh, but uh, it, it just represented more opportunities for them to uh, further their career objectives. I got to say I enjoyed the, the company Etta. You know, that, that was a pleasure. Um, mainly because it, she, she gave me so much room. You know, she gave me room to grow and, ex, and, and explore. But, because um, she was a stylist, see, or is a stylist. And, um, and so, you know, her charts weren't always that tight, you know. She, in fact, when we were doing a record date, you know, she would sometimes complain to the producer about, you know, you got this thing too tight. I want to hear this thing swinging, you know. She's got to feel the, you know, she's got to put her in the pocket, otherwise she didn't feel right about it. So that I always enjoyed accompanying her, but I think uh, other than her. Uh, the vocalist that uh, I admired the most, and I'm sorry I didn't have a, a, a longer period of time to 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 work with him, was Joe Williams. Uh, Joe is just I don't, words can't describe. He is uh, uh, first of all, you know, one terrific gentleman. He's not generally thought of that way, <laughs> but he is a, a heck of a gentleman, and. Uh, very masterful artist, and uh, and so it's it's uh, that was a particular pleasure. Now, on the occasions that I worked with Roy Haynes, uh, gee, I might as well have been in the audience because uh, 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 I, uh, Roy Haynes played s such incredibly, incredibly lyrical drums. That uh, sometimes I could I could hardly I could hardly play you know from listening to what he was doing you know just fantastic um, so I enjoyed that um, I I enjoyed every one of those experiences I I can't think of one one negative uh, uh, experience in that re in that regard um, I even enjoyed working with. Uh, Rasan Roland Kirk, which I did several times, and uh, it was always a bit of a war. But another another memorable gig was 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 right here uh, at the old Drum Lounge with uh, with with uh, Wes Montgomery, and um, so um, uh, the music's been very good to me in that regard because you know I've just been blessed blessed with all of those experiences, you know, as a, as a youngster coming up. And um, uh, again, my biggest concern now, you know, is somehow or another 
pre pre preserving the essence of all of that and hopefully being able to impart some of that, you know, to, uh, to the, some of the folks that are coming up now. I didn't spend enough time in New York. Um, and I was out working on the road with a vocalist now as, as her music director and accompanist. Now, you got to understand that we did not have a full group, for one thing. Uh, we would work, I, I was it, and then we would have to pick up the rest of the rhythm section in most of the places that we went to. Um, that was not particularly uh, music, uh, musically challenging. That is to say, I was not sustaining, I didn't feel like I was sustaining any kind of growth. And, uh, and except for those occasions when we, you know, we'd go to Philly, you know, and we'd have Sam Doc, I mean, um, Spanky DeBrest or somebody like that, or we'd go out to uh, Chicago, uh, out to uh, California where we had <clears throat> George Moore and, and Donald Dean, uh, you know, as our, as our steadies for a, a three or four month period. Um, all the rest of it was like pickup groups, and sometimes those pickup groups were really, really very sad. It was all we could do, you know, to get, get them through the show. So on a personal basis, what I was, what, what I was experiencing was, uh, I, I felt that, you know, I was falling way behind in, you know, my musical direction, and maybe even proudness, you know, and uh, it was a certain, Mm, well, there was a certain there was certain lack of confidence set in, you know. So I ultimately came home because of that. Well, when I got here, I, I found a scene that was in big trouble. Uh, there was little music going on. Odom's Cave was still happening in a few places like that, but uh, uh, there certainly wasn't. Uh, it was not. It was nothing like it had been. You know, even five or six years prior to that. And, um, and there weren't any touring artists being brought into town um, during that late 60s period. Uh, there was a real dearth of musical activity. Um, but I dealt with whatever there was to be dealt with. Yeah, got my first day job and uh, and tried to try to apply the craft in the uh, in the evenings and um, I think it was in 67 it was in 67 that uh, Stanley Kyle Stanley Kyle had been working with Ron Brooks in uh, in Ann Arbor at the town bar, and he left to go on the road with, with uh, Roland, uh, Russ on Roland Kirk. And uh, Ron Brooks called me up there uh, to uh, fill in for Stan. And uh, we were playing at the old town bar. And then uh, these two guys, uh, Charles Moore, that's Charles Eugene Moore, <laughs> uh, and uh, Leon Henderson, Joel's brother started coming up to to the town bar to, to sit in, and uh, uh, we uh, developed such an affinity that, uh, that that we started transcribing tunes and rehearsing, and and uh, we really enjoyed playing together. We, in fact, enjoyed playing together so much that we were actually breaking the curfew during the riots to go back and forth to Ann Arbor to play at the town bar. I mean, we were running the risk of getting shot or incarcerated just so we could play together. And um, out of that, that grouping, of course, was uh, formed the, uh, the Contemporary Jazz Quintet, which I still must say at, at this point, um, on balance has been my ultimate musical experience. Um, that was an incredible, something incredible happened with that band that it never has happened with me in any other musical
those circumstances. <laughs> as a working musician, um, I work more as a side man. Um, uh, in this idiom, I work more as a side man uh, in, in concerts and uh, occasional club dates and so forth. Um, oddly enough, uh, I probably work more as a band leader doing private parties and so They pay well. <laughs> You know, you get a chance to play some matured music, <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, and uh, and so uh, you know, as a very practical matter, you know, that's that's what I've been doing musically. So to, to keep the hand in, and halfway keeps the chops up, and and uh, make a, a dignified dollar. Because I, I think all the musicians, I know that all of the musicians are entitled to a, a dignified dollar, but it's kind of hard to come by these days. Mm -hmm.